This lecture is on chapter 7.1 to chapter 7.3 on electrolytes and types of aqueous reactions and net ionic equations. So we left off before the in the last class uh, talking about aqueous solutions and molarity. So let's uh, discuss a little more about um, aqueous solutions and understanding how how aqueous compounds can uh, react with each other to form different types of, of products. And so when we're dealing with aqueous solutions, it's important to understand the concept of electrolyte versus non-electrolyte. So electrolytes are substances that dissolve in water to produce conducting solutions of ions. So for example, if we see sodium chloride, the, the ionic compound, uh, the crystal lattice associated with the repeating sodium and chloride ion uh, matrix here. When it's dissolved in water, it totally dissociates, 100% dissociation into Na plus cations and Cl minus anions. And so the presence of these charged species, these positive and negatively charged uh, uh, ions in solution, allow the solution to actually conduct electricity. Whereas non-electrolytes are substances that dissolve in an aqueous solution that do not produce ions uh, when dissolved. So for example, glucose here is a molecule that dissolves readily in water to form uh, just, we go from glucose solid to glucose aqueous. It doesn't uh, dissociate at all into any ionic form. It just carries its same uh, net zero molecular charge. And so these non-electrolytes do not produce an electrically conductive solution, whereas electrolytes do. So let's think about how how this electrical conductivity actually comes into place. So I don't know if you've ever done this experiment in your high school chemistry or physics class or not, but what you can do here is if you hook up two sides of a wire to the poles of positive and negative poles of a battery, you can have those poles go through a light bulb and then into a solution that's either an electrolyte or a non-electrolyte solution. And then you have two, so those wires are going to hook up to two electrodes. So electrodes are just um, solid materials that can conduct electricity. And so when you hook up those solutions into an electrolyte solution, such as sodium chloride, which is table salt, uh, dissolved into water, you can see that a, a, um, electro, the electrical uh, conductivity is carried through that solution and allows the light bulb to light up. Whereas if you use a sugar solution such as sucrose, you could hook up in that same aqueous solution with sucrose and show that the electrical signal is not conducted through that solution. So why does that actually happen? So if we think about how electrical signal moves. So without knowing a whole lot about electrical conductivity, we can get a baseline understanding of how things work. So what I've drawn up here on the board is a beaker with an aqueous solution. And then we have two different electrodes that are going to go to the positive and negative sides of a battery. Okay. And so when you have so the the movement of electricity is the or so the the movement of current that causes electricity is the movement of electrons throughout some sort of con conductive material so through a wire you're going to see these electrons are going to move freely through a wire and then freely through our conductive material that we call an electrode So these electrons have now traveled all the way from the battery through the wire, through our electrode, and now have come to our, our uh, two electrodes within the solution. So in order for an electrical conductivity to actually be able to uh, fully travel from one pole of the battery to the other through the solution, we need to have something to be able to carry that current through the solution. And so what we actually have that moves the current through the solution are ions. So we have this negative pole of the battery, 
which comes to one electrode. So this electrode, we can think of as having a negative charge. And we have the positive pole of the battery going to the other electrode that we can think of having a positive charge. And so in order for this electrical current to actually complete the circuit, we need to move these negatively charged electrodes from the negative pole to the positive pole of the electrode. So what actually carries that current are these positive and negatively charged ions in solution. So what we can see is if we have Na plus and Cl minus in solution, you can have a net movement of your chloride negatively charged ions towards the positive pole or the positive electrode, and you can have movement of your positively charged ions to the negative pole. And so these net movement of these ions in solution can actually serve to carry that electrical current all the way through that solution and allow that current to then flow back into the other pole of, of the battery. Okay, so it's that movement of these ions within solutions that actually allows for that net flow of the electrical current. So now let's think about the condition when we have a non-electrolyte such as sucrose or sugar dissolved in the solution. Okay, so we have our battery hooked up. We have the electrons are moving as current through our wire and then into our electrode. And then we have this glucose molecule that has a net charge of zero. So there's no there's no um, uh, electrical energy here in order to force that glucose to move either towards the positive or negative pole. So there's going to be no net movement of that glucose. So as a result, we're going to see that, that elect these electrons are not allowed to move through the solution. So therefore, that electron movement is going to stop at the electrode itself, and it's not going to be able to, to continue to flow through, through the solution and then into the other pole of the battery. So that's the main difference we can see here between our, our um, conductive electrolyte and our non-conductive non-electrolytes. Okay, so not all electrolytes are created equal. So we have two different types of electrolytes, strong electrolytes and weak electrolytes. So strong electrolytes are compounds that dissociate to a large extent into ions when dissolved in water. And so we can see here, for example, HCl, when you dissolve it in water, completely dissociates to H plus and Cl minus ions. And so we can tell that this, this dissociation is robust and complete because we have a unidirectional arrow. So the arrow is going one directional from left to right. Whereas weak electrolytes are where compounds that dissociate to a small extent into ions when dissolved in water. And for example, this is acetic acid dissociating into H plus and acetate. And we can see that there is a bidirectional arrow where there was one pole going forward and the other pole going backwards. And so we can see that this forms what's called an equilibrium which is a ratio, basically, of how much it dissociates to the product and how much it stays in form of the reactant. So strong electrolytes 100% dissociate from its reactants to products, whereas weak electrolytes have an equilibrium where only partially dissociates into its products and part of it stays in its reactants. And we'll get into strong and weak electrolytes in much more detail in general chemistry, too. Okay, so you can see here that both of these dissociation reactions are follow this general format where we have AB dissociates to AN plus plus BN minus. So we can see here, this is the splitting of basically an ionic compound here, where we're going to be splitting into our, our N plus, which is going to be our, our cation, and our N minus, which is going to be our anion, where these N terms here are going to be our our uh, subscripts that are shown down below, the associated positive and negative charges for cations and anions respectively.
And so those are classified as dissociation reactions. Okay, so if we compare, so if we take a look at some of these typical strong electrolytes, weak electrolytes, and non-electrolytes, we can see that strong electrolytes consist uh, strong acids. So again, these are things that we're going to get into more in general chemistry too. So examples of strong acids are hydrochloric acid, hydrobromic acid, hy hydroiodic acid, uh, perchloric acid, nitric acid, and sulfuric acid. We also have ionic salts. So these are potassium bromide, sodium chloride, and then strong bases, which are sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide. And so weak electrolytes, examples of those are weak acids, such as sulfur or sorry, acetic acid, hydrofluoric acid, and hydrocyanic acid. And some of the non-electrolytes or examples are water, methanol, ethanol, uh, sugar, and most are organic uh, carbon-based compounds. Okay, so it's just a good idea to keep track of, of some of the common materials that would be strong electrolytes that totally dissociate weak electrolytes that only partially dissociate, and non-electrolytes that do not dissociate at all. Okay, so we need to consider how conductive are each of these different materials going to be. So our strong electrolytes are going to by far be our most conductive of all of our materials, whereas our weak electrolytes are only going to be partially conductive of electricity, and our non-electrolytes are going to be totally insulating, which means they are non-conductive. All right, so let's work through this question real quick. Which of the following would you expect is a non-electrolyte that would not conduct electricity at all? So take a moment to think about that. Okay, the correct answer here is B, H2O, which is water. So we can see that water is listed as a non-electrolyte on our previous slide. And going through the rest of them, HCl, hydrochloric acid, is a strong acid, so that's a strong electrolyte. KBr, potassium bromide, is an ionic compound, so that's a strong electrolyte. HF is hydrofluoric acid, that is a weak acid, so that's a weak electrolyte. And H2SO4 is a strong acid, so that is a strong electrolyte. So let's consider the dissociation of strong electrolytes. So note the molar ratio between non-dissociated and dissociated forms. So one mole of sodium sulfate results in two moles of Na plus and one mole of SO4 two minus. Therefore, there are three moles of total ion concentration. Okay, so if we take a look at this dissociation equation down here, we have one mole. So we look and simply look at the, the, the stoichiometric coefficients. We can see there's one mole of Na2SO4, when you dissolve in water, it totally dissociates to two moles of Na plus and one mole of sulfate. And so the total number of products, we go from one to one, two plus one equals three. So dissolving actually increases the number of individual components are in the solution. So therefore, if we have two moles of sodium sulfate, if we have two moles of Na2SO4, therefore we would have four moles of Na plus and two moles of sulfate. Four plus two equals six moles of total ion concentration. So I ask you the question, if we started out with three moles of sodium sulfate, how many moles of sodium and how many moles of sulfate, and how many total moles of ions would we have in our solution? So if we started off with three moles of sodium sulfate, that would split into three times two, which is six moles of Na+, and three times one is three moles of sulfate. So six plus three is going to give us nine moles of total ion concentration. So you can see when we dissolve these ions, we're going to increase the number of total particles in solution. So I ask you the question, what is the molar concentration of each ions in a 0.35 molarity solution of strong electrolytes of iron-3 bromide, assuming complete dissociation? 
what is the total ion concentration? So take a moment to work through that on your own. Okay, first off, we need to work through the dissociation equation. So iron 3 bromide means we have an FeBr3 is going to dissociate in water to form Fe3 plus aqueous plus 3Br minus aqueous. So we know the charges on these individual ions because iron 3 indicates that this is a, um, a 3 plus transition metal ion. And we know that bromine is a halogen, meaning that it's going to have a minus one overall charge. And so we can see one in the subscript on the solid gives us one stoichiometric coefficient, and three subscript on the, the bromide gives us three in our stoichiometric coefficient. So if we start off with 0 0.350 molarity of our, our iron bromide solid, we have a one-to-one -one ratio stating 0 0.350 molarity of iron 3 plus. And then for the bromide, we have 0 0.350 times 3, which is going to give us 1.050 molarity for our bromide. Okay, and then so our overall concentration of ions in solution are going to be the summation of these two values. So 1.050 molarity plus 0 0.350 molarity is going to give us 1.400 molarity total ion concentration in solution. All right, next. So sodium chromate is a strong electrolyte which dissociates to sodium ions and dichromate anion. What is the total ion concentration in a 0 0.450 molarity solution of sodium dichromate? So take a moment to work through that. Okay, the correct answer here is E. So let's work through this together. So we're going to have Na2Cr2O7 solid is going to totally dissociate into 2Na plus aqueous. So 2 comes from the subscript. And this dichromate stays together. So plus Cr2O7 aqueous. So if we start off with 0 0.450 molarity of the sodium dichromate, we multiply that value by 2 for our sodium value, which is going to give us 0 0.900 molarity. And then we have a 1 to 1 molar ratio for the dichromate, giving us 0 0.450 molarity. And if we add these two guys together now, we're going to get our final answer of 1.350 molarity, which corresponds to our answer E. Okay, so now let's consider the types of chemical reactions that we observe when we mix together different aqueous species together. So the first type of reaction that we're going to consider is called a precipitation reaction. And so precipitation reactions are processes in which soluble ionic reactants yield an insoluble solid product that falls out of solution. So here we can see that mixing together two reactants that are aqueous, so both of these are, are aqueous salts, okay, so we have lead to nitrate and potassium iodide, both aqueous are going to form together to form an aqueous, an aqueous salt, and then a solid salt. And we can see that formation here as this yellow solid precipitate forming by the mixture of two clear aqueous uh, solutions. And so we can uh, observe that 
what happens in these precipitation reactions is what's called a double displacement reaction. So if we classify our, our cation and anion associated in the salts as A and B, and then C and D, we can see that the cations and anions just basically switch partners. So A is now linked up with D as AD, and B is now linked up with C in CB. Okay, so we basically switch dance partners and in called a double displacement reaction. And if you form a solid here, then this is considered a precipitation reaction. Okay, so double displacement or double replacement, double displacement, both interchangeable words. If they form a solid, it is a precipitation reaction. Next is an acid-base neutralization reaction. So these are processes in which an acid reacts with a base to yield water plus an ionic compound called a salt. So here we have an acid, so HCl, hydrochloric acid, combining with a base, which is sodium hydroxide, to yield water plus a salt. So the key aspect here, you're going to have a, a, an acid, which is typically going to be a species that includes an H, at least one H in its structure, a base, which typically involves an OH in their structure, not always, but typically involves an OH. But the key aspect is it's going to form that liquid water and then an aqueous salt. Okay, it could form a solid salt, but typically it's aqueous. Okay, so acid base forms a liquid and a salt. Precipitation are two aqueous salts coming together to form a solid salt product. Next, oxidation reduction or redox reactions are processes in which one or more electrons are transferred between reaction partners, atoms, molecules, or ions. Okay, an example of this, we have magnesium solid mixing together with hydrochloric acid to form uh, magnesium chloride, aqueous salt, and uh, H2 hydrogen gas. Okay, and so we're going to go into oxid uh, redox reactions in much more detail in a couple, uh, in about three lectures, I believe. Uh, but so one of the key hallmarks that we're going to see from redox reactions are overall changes in states of matter. So we're going to see solids disappearing, gas bubbles forming, etc. So now that we've introduced three different types of chemical reactions, let's go over how we actually write these chemical equations in a more succinct fashion. So we have a couple different ways of writing equations. The first of which that you've already been introduced is the molecular equation. So the molecular equation is writing all substances involved in the reaction are written using their complete formulas as if they were molecules. Okay, so the, the end de part of the definition, as if they were molecules, you got to remember this lead, nit lead to nitrate, the potassium iodide, these are actually ions. So they're not actually, there's no covalent bonds. These aren't, these aren't ions here. These are actually salts. Okay, so, but you're going to write them together as formulas as if they were uh, covalently bound molecules. Okay, so the molecular equation is written just as we're written right here. OK, so you're not dissociating any of these different strong electrolytes. You're keeping everything together in your molecular equation. Next is the total ionic equation. So in the total ionic equation, all of the strong electrolytes are written as ions. So we know that lead nitrate is a aqueous salt where we have total 100% dissociation. So the total ionic equation, you split the lead 2 plus as its own species, the two nitrate anions as its own species, the two potassium cations as its own, the two iodide anions as its own, the two potassium ions in the, in the product as its own, the two nitrates in its product as its own, and then we keep together anything that's a solid or a gas or a pure liquid are the, uh, the only species that we keep together in its sort of, quote, molecular format. So the total ionic equation, we split apart any of the strong electrolytes. So when we have this total ionic equation, we can identify what are called spectator ions. 
So spectator ions are ions that undergo no change during the reaction and appear on both sides of the reaction arrow. So we can notice that two potassium cations and two nitrate anions are present on the reactants and the product sides. So therefore, these spectator ions are not actually participating in the reaction. They're spectators. They're just viewing the reaction. They're not actually uh, key players in the reaction. So since these spectator ions are, ions are not actually participating in this reaction, we can remove them in what's called a net ionic equation, which is the type of, of equation that only includes the ions undergoing change in the reaction. So when we took a look at our total ionic equation, the only thing that held together in its molecular format was this lead to iodide. And so for the net ionic equation, we have cut out the potassium and the nitrate that were spectator ions, and we only include the lead 2 plus plus 2 iodide, giving us our lead iodide. So it's the most straightforward, succinct um, way of representing our equation. Okay, so I invite you guys to work through the following net ionic equation, or the following uh, reactions shown here, and write up the net ionic equation for the following reactions. And note that all of these reactions are actually in their molecular format. So I'd pause the video and work through those on your own. Okay, the first one, we have two HCl aqueous plus Zinc solid yields H2 gas plus zinc chloride aqueous. Okay, so we can split these now into our total ionic equation. So we have two of our H plus aqueous plus two of our Cl minus aqueous. So we just multiply that stoichiometric coefficient by each plus zinc solid yields H2 gas plus zinc 2 plus aqueous. So we know this is a 2 plus because that 2 subscript tells us that we have a zinc 2 plus. And then we have 2 plus 2 Cl minus aqueous. And we know it is a uh, Cl minus both because it's a halogen and because the subscript on the zinc is a 1. So now we identify any spectator ions that are present on both sides, and we can see that this Cl- is present on both sides, so we can cut those out from the net ionic equation. And so our final result is 2 H plus aqueous plus zinc solid yields H2 gas plus zinc 2 plus aqueous. So that's our overall net ionic equation for our first problem. Next, we have our second one, which states 2 AgNO3 aqueous plus Na2CrO4 aqueous yields Ag2CrO4 solid plus 2 NaNO3 aqueous. We can now split this in our total ionic equation, saying that 2 Ag plus plus 2 NO3 minus, okay, again, we're multiplying that stoichiometric coefficient to each of our constituents, plus 2, we have a 2 subscript for Na plus aqueous plus CrO4, that would be 2 minus aqueous, and we know it's 2 minus because there was a 2 subscript on our sodium, is going to yield, this is a solid, so we keep it together, Ag2CrO4, solid, plus 2 Na plus aqueous, plus 2 NO3 minus aqueous. So we identify all of our spectator ions now. We have two nitrates and two sodiums, two sodiums, two nitrates. 
So we can cut those out for our net ionic equation to state we have two Ag plus aqueous plus CrO4 two minus aqueous to form Ag2CrO4 solid. Okay, so we have a two aqueous going to form a solid, and this is going to be a precipitation reaction. The first one, by the way, was a redox reaction, but we'll get to that in a couple classes. Next one, we have H2SO4 aqueous plus MgCO3 solid to yield H2O liquid plus CO2 gas plus MgSO4 aqueous. Okay, so we can now split these guys apart. So we have two H plus plus SO4, two minus aqueous, and we know it's a two minus because we have a two subscript on our H, plus we have a solid here, so that stays together, MgCO3, solid, is going to form, this is a liquid, so we keep pure liquids together, H2O liquid, CO2 is a gas, we keep that together because it's a pure gas, And then we have an aqueous salt here, and we know that magnesium is an alkaline earth metal, so that's gonna have a two plus charge. And we know sulfate's two minus, so we'll split those apart into Mg2 plus aqueous plus SO4 two minus aqueous. So now when we take a look for our, our um, spectator ions, we can see that sulfate is present on both sides. So we can cut those out and find our net ionic equation, 2H plus aqueous plus our solid magnesium carbonate will yield H2O liquid plus CO2 gas. Okay? Next. We have HgNO32, so mercury nitrate aqueous plus NH4I. We have two of those, excuse me. So that's ammonium iodide aqueous yields solid mercury iodide plus two ammonium nitrate aqueous. Okay, again, we split apart our aqueous uh, solutions into their uh, total ionic equation. So we know the charge on mercury here is going to be a two plus. We have two nitrates. Okay, we split, we have two ammonium and we have two iodides. Are going to yield our solid. We keep our solid mercury iodide together. And then we have our two ammonium and our two nitrate. Both of those aqueous. We identify our spectator ions. So we have two nitrate and two ammonium here, two ammonium, two nitrate here. We can cut out those spectator ions and we're left with Hg2 plus aqueous plus two I minus aqueous yielding HgI2 solid. All right, that's it for the day, thank you.